بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد This talk would be mostly uh, targeted or I would say conveyed towards the non-Muslims and of course like, like the Sheikh uh, mentioned to me, just a few minutes back, we were sitting in one of these, uh, mashallah, panels, uh, the tents that the, the KSA has uh, organized. One of them has video. Uh, there's a tent where they're playing a video about is, uh, Islamic and Quranic mi miracles. So, uh, uh, the Sheikh mentioned that, subhanallah, the uh, Muslims themselves they are lagging or lacking from the knowledge of, his, of Islam and the Quran. It's just, he gave an example just like how when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is the reason my brothers, those who are amongst, uh, who are listening or on video, this is the reason why there are so many misconceptions about Islam. Because of what the non-Muslims they see Muslims practicing or rather not practicing about Islam and this is one of the biggest inshallah answers or uh, you know solutions to countering the misconception of Islam to practice and read the Quran and practice it the way Prophet Muhammad sallallahu has taught us to rather than become people who are reactionary you know they, they react to uh, certain situations and then they come out and organize events countering certain heretic acts of some uh, so-called Muslims so the Sheikh was saying just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentioned he commanded all those who were there when he created Adam, we know the story of Adam or Adam in English, when he was created by Allah out of clay, he, Allah Azza wa Jal, commanded everyone to prostrate, bow down, make sajda to Adam. All of them who was there amongst the angels and whatever creation that we know of and we don't know of, that Allah Azza wa Jal has informed us about or has not informed us about whoever was there they prostrated and made sajda to Adam because of the command of Allah Azza wa Jal because Allah commanded them it was not a sajda of worship but it was the worship of Allah because of obeying Allah Azza wa Jal to prostrate they prostrated to Adam a new creation which was created out of Teen, which is created out of uh, clay, earth. Except for who? Except for Iblis, Shaitan, Iblis. Except for Iblis, the Shaitan, everyone prostrated. So the Sheikh actually gave me this analogy that today the condition of certain Muslims is such that Allah Azza wa Jal is telling us to read the Quran but we are not reading the Quran so we are like who? 
He is commanding us to do certain things, but we are not doing it. So we are like who? Are we like those angels who Allah Azza wa Jal says, do it and they did? Sama'na wa ata'ana? Or are we like Shaitan Iblis when Allah is commanding us through, throughout the Quran, but we are not obeying Him? Who are we like? And this is one of the greatest reasons of the misconceptions that people have with regards to Islam. Al Muhim coming back to those who want to understand why there are misconceptions about Islam must understand that number one, I've already mentioned that Islam should be uh, practiced as it was propagated as it has been uh, stipulated in the Quran and propagated by Muhammad and his companions and those who followed them in righteousness. These are the people, these are the sources that where Islam comes from. Anything apart from that which contradicts the Quran or the teachings of Prophet Muhammad or those of his companions, teachings of his companions, or even the students of the companions. If any of the practices that you see of Islam, anybody can claim that I'm a Muslim. There were people at the time of Prophet Muhammad who claimed to be Muslim. Did you know that? There, there were people at the time of Prophet Muhammad who claimed to be Muslim, but they were called munafiks, munafiqeen, hypocrites. They claimed to be Muslim, but they were, Allah, God Almighty revealed in revelation that they were munafiqeen. Prophet Muhammad warned the Sahaba, that soon there will be some people who will be reciting the Quran, but it will not go below their throat. And he said they will be the Khawarij. This is why there are misconceptions of Islam. One of the reasons why there are mis uh, misconceptions that people have is because there are people who are claiming to be Muslim, but their actions are against the Quran and teachings of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. The other thing that people who are truly willing to understand why these misconceptions exist, you will first have to understand that the Quran says it gives us certain criterion or criteria and it gives a certain methodology. The Quran which we believe is the final revelation from the creation of the heavens and the earth. It gives us very scientific and orderly methodology to understand anything that you want. And the first thing that the Quran says is that if you don't open your intellect and your hearts, if you have closed your intellect and if you have decided on something nobody can it's like how if there is a glass okay and if you put it upside down will you be able to pour water in it if a glass is put on table upside down nobody can put water in it so you have to put the glass in a way that you can pour water in it your hearts and your intellect should be like that glass if you're going to put it upside down nobody no no matter what I say or any scholar of Islam says, or anybody, it will not affect you. So it's not for those people. As Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in the Quran, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadhakkara ulul albab. This is the blessed book that we have revealed to you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That people with understanding may reflect over its verses and those with understanding can derive a lesson. You see the criterion is very clear. This is the book, the Quran, for the people 
with and who are with some understanding can derive a lesson they can reflect on its verses and those people who don't want to understand you cannot make them understand no matter what you do so we move forward there is certain methodology given in the Quran how a person can attain or become a person of understanding you know there are so many verses more I think more than 16 verses in the Quran which talk about Ya Ulul Albab O people of understanding Ya Ulul Albab O people of understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God Almighty mentions throughout the Quran now and again Ya Ulul Albab O people of understanding so if you want to understand you can open your hearts and your intellects and your minds and you can understand that the Quran has given us how you can become number one of the one of the ways that you can become a person of understanding is alam tara anna Allah anzala min as-sama imaan and Allah goes on to say that do you not see that Allah sent down water from the sky then made it flow on earth as springs and streams and rivers and then with it he brings forth vegetation of various hues then this vegetation ripens and dries up turning yellow where after he reduces it to broken straw surely there is a lesson in this for those endowed with understanding for those who are people of understanding so one of the ways is to reflect on the creation of God to go and reflect on the creation of of the Sun and the moon how the Sun and the moon goes around you know in, in uh, orbit how vegetation or, or water comes from the sky like is mentioned and the lifeless earth becomes lush and green how does this happen how come there are millions of nerves in your body it doesn't get tangled no matter wh what you do see the athletes they are running up and down jumping there are millions of nerves but this headphone set uh, uh, cable whenever you take it out from the pocket you have to spend five minutes to open it up but Allah Azza wa Jal has created nerves in our body which never get tangled and the blood is flowing inside in a perfect order which it was not to be the case then it would not be possible for us to be living today the bad blood would go in the good blood and the veins will get entangled and there is no way a human can survive how is this happening so it is for the people of understanding and this exhibition my non-muslim brothers and sisters in Islam uh, uh, you know in humanity this exhibition is a very good platform for you to understand where I had a small tour of the exhibition and we saw that there are so many verses of the Quran which are mentioned 1400 years back now the question is a thousand four hundred years back how was it possible for Muhammad a person who lived at a time when there were hardly anybody who could read and write did you know that at the time of Muhammad sallam, what was the percentage of people who could read and write I'm not talking about educated people from universities from all around the world I'm not talking about people who have PhDs or master degrees and baccalaureates I'm talking about people who could only read and write there was an approximate population in Arabia where Prophet Muhammad sallam, lived about 50 to 60 thousand this is what the approximation is done by the historians about 50 to 60 thousand and did you know how many people could read and write in the time of Muhammad if I was to ask someone I'm hundred percent sure nobody would be able to give the exact answer unless you have gone and read it in an encyclopedia does anybody know over here in the crowd 
What was the percentage of educated people who could read or write in the time of Muhammad Sallallahu If anybody knows, can you please raise your hands? Anyone? Do you know the answer? Anybody knows the answer? Yes. Yes, brother, what is your answer? Zero? No, there were some people who could read and write. Otherwise, how would you get the Quran today? People wrote the Quran, isn't it? Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu and others who were scribes. And they were scribes of Judeo-Christian scriptures as well who used to write the, the Bible and, uh, you know, the, the Torah. So, anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, let me just move forward because, oh, yes, there is one brother. Less than uh, 20%. Less than 20%. So 50 to 60,000 people, 20% would be how much? 12,000? 12,000, right? You're saying there were 12,000 or maybe less people who knew how to read or write? Are you sure? He's saying there were from... Yes, Sheikh. His Sheikh is saying, no, it's not possible. There were less than that, isn't it? There were, let me tell you the answer. There were only 50 or 60 people known to read or write in the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is the percentage point? 1%. There were only 50 to 60 people who could read and write. This is why Allah Azza wa Jal, He said in the Quran, He called the people of Muhammad and even Muhammad وسلم, that he was sent to the Ummiyeen. That Allah Azza wa Jal he sent to the people Ummiyeen a messenger who came to teach them to read and to uh, teach them the book from Allah and hikmah and wisdom and give them wisdom. Today modern science cannot, cannot and please my non-Muslim brothers and sisters, you have to go and have a look inside this ex beautiful exhibition that KSA has organized. You have to go and have at least one time even if you just are you know, curious about what I'm saying. 1,400 years back, how did Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when there was hardly anybody who could read or write, he came up with such miraculous verses that are talking about embryology, that are talking about science of the skin. Uh, in one of the videos I saw, there was a professor from Thailand who was a skin specialist. He is a scientist. And he made research and he, when the ayahs of the Quran were shown to him that Allah Azza wa Jal has mentioned, which is claimed people, non, some of the Orientalists, they say that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wrote the Quran. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he couldn't read or write himself. He was from the Ummiyeen. He had, when the revelations came to him from Allah, he had to recite it to certain appointed people to write it down. He couldn't even read or write. When the first time Jibreel, alayhi salam, the Ruh al Amin, the Spirit, came to him and he said, Iqra, the first word that Jibreel, alayhi salam, the messenger from Allah, when he came to Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi salam, the messenger to mankind. The first thing when he came to him, you know what he said? He didn't say, Salaamu Alaikum, I'm Jibreel, I come from Allah. No. But he said, Iqra. This is one of the greatest signs to the people of understanding. The first word that was revealed in the final revelation from God was Iqra. Read. Read. And this is the first word that is given to mankind as well. Read, O oh my brothers and sisters. Without reading, you can't, as Imam Shafi'i said, that 
knowledge is so important that it is more important than even food and drink or was it uh, imam ahmed ibn hanbal i forget he said about ilm was it ahmed ibn hanbal or imam ash-shafi one of them al muhim the imam of ahl sunnah they said that knowledge is more important than even food and drink because without food and drink you can survive one day two days three days but without knowledge you cannot even move your step one or two left or right without having knowledge of where you should go what is your destination you cannot do nothing without knowledge and this is why allah he gave us a sign to the people of understanding read iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq and prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said i don't know how to read he couldn't read or write then how did he come with these verses that are talking about embryology that are talking about you know the uh, uh, the planets the sun and the moon going in orbits 1400 years back something to understand so the misconceptions of of islam my brothers i can go on about talking about jihad talking about isis talking about all these you know women's rights which are so popularized in the media but the people of understanding will go back to the sources and the source of islam is number 1 the quran number 2 the teachings of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam number 3 the practice of the companions that lived and died as muslims in the time of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and number 4 the uh, righteous people who followed them and their students these are the sources of islam and the people of understanding will go back to the sources rather than the media or the popular you know people who want to make propaganda false propaganda for whatever reasons for politics for gaining money making business getting gaining more viewers on youtube on their channels or whatever reasons they create wars they create you know they there are so many examples i can keep going on and on about and i pray to allah azza wa jal that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala god almighty makes every one of you who's listening to this talk from the people of understanding and some of the ways that you can become a person of understanding i'll enumerate it very quickly from the quran number 1 to reflect on the creation of allah number 2 to hear and listen the first step of communication is to hear and listen and reflect and wisely think about that knowledge this is what we require to do from the quran and the teachings of prophet muhammad says number 3 to reflect on the examples that are given in the history and in the quran about the people of the past what happened to the people of lut what happened to the people of ad and samud for example and in the end allah azza wa jalla says hudan wa dhikra li ul al albab and eventually by these steps eventually inshallah you will get guidance and you will be able to better understand and become the people of understanding and i pray to god almighty that these mis- misconceptions uh that we have today there are so many uh the the that through this lecture or through the this exhibition we will be able to uh dispel them aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullahi li lakum fastaghfiru innahu huwal ghafurur rahim subhanakallahu wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh innal hamdalillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina may yahdihillahu وما هدل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون and this lecture it is uh, titled as uh, the misguided youth i 
I really would like to call it the guided youth, actually, you know. We are not here to misguide the youth, or I don't think that uh, the youth is really misguided, because the youth will only be on the foundations of what the society or the elderly and the, their parents or their elderly have provided them. For example, if you have a few children in the house, and this is especially towards an advice towards the sisters who have some young uh, babies at home. Just because you need to do get some chores done in the house, the most f popular and famous thing nowadays to do is to hand one of these devices to the children. Isn't that what happens? In order so you can finish your work, you leave the child with a with some kind of guidance or misguidance that's all you can do either you are giving guidance or you're giving misguidance to this person uh, to this child so it is very important that you know you don't even have such a thing that will misguide your youth in your houses instead of having devices to keep them busy go and buy books and fill your rooms with books that can the, the children can be busy with while reading, uh, you know, while you do your work. And they could be reading books of all kinds, inshallah, which are halal. Knowledge of the dunya and knowledge of the deen. So this is one of the problems of the society today, the uh, electronic media. And when we address this topic of the youth, we have so many advices from Prophet Muhammad and from the Quran. One of the first things that Prophet he taught the parents to teach their children is Tawheed, is uttering words of, of Tawheed or teaching the children about Allah. And this is why the ulema, they say, you should ask questions and you should train the children to worship Allah the way he deserves to be worshipped. And ask them questions like, where is Allah? And you will see by nature, a little child will point towards the sky. And in the Quran and Sunnah, we find so many such examples. We know of the Sahaba who were young, who were from the Mushrik families. They were new reverts to Islam, if you like to call it in modern terminology. And after having reverted from Shirk, they gave everything away for La ilaha illallah, for the shahadatain. And we have heard stories of different sahaba from the history of Islam. And we know the sacrifices, sacrifices that they have made. And we know of the lives that they lived before and after Islam. One of such Sahaba was, uh, as, as it comes in the history books of Islam, about Julaibib radiallahu anhu. He was known to be a short, skinny, not very attractive looking young man. And he was always at the comp in the company of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa His lineage was not known, his parents, his, uh, you know, great uh, grandparents and his appearance was diminutive and he did not have a tribe or a clan to protect him and he looked like a cut off lonely figure 
not a very attractive looking young man but he was always in the companion of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so one day prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he asked him like he would ask sometimes the sahaba what would you like to do uh, o julaibib radiyallahu anhu what do you desire of something you ask for inshallah and then julaibib he said that what can i ask from you o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam i get to sit with you at your feet and listen to you your teachings what more can i ask for and i get your noble companionship prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told him that you can ask for whatever you desire so he gave him an option he said what about getting married and this is one of the things that some of the youth it's very attractive to them right especially at certain age and especially when the fitna is so widespread he said would you like to get married o julaibi julaibi knowing that he was not very attractive looking young man especially what the media and internet has made famous somebody who should look like a certain film star malun film star somebody who should be such tall dark and handsome and he should have a deen and a beard and he should have a car and a good job and he should be an engineer or a doctor you know this is the kind of people that nowadays some families or sisters will look for however julaibi was nothing like that so he knew that it was something that was very uh, unlikely to happen but Mo prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is asking him so he said okay uh, he was shy and he agreed so prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took him to one of the ansar's house that he knew one of the sahaba and he said i have come he knocked the door he said salam the sahabi opened the door he was very delighted to see rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said i would like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage so the sahabi who who has a daughter he was very happy and he was very excited so prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said no no it's not for me it's for julaibi so he said it's for julaibi he said yes i'm asking for your daughter for julaibi now julaibi what did he have really frankly speaking let us ask this question he didn't have a degree or a or a big family he didn't have wealth he didn't have very good looks he was not very tall he was a pretty short diminutive man and he didn't have any uh, influence in the society or anyone to protect him if he was you know cornered with whatever uh, tragedies or uh, the the uh, you know oppression that was going on on muslims even at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the only thing julaibi he had was the companionship of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the quran and the sunnah that's all he had the deen so but even so even then the sahabi said let me go and consult with my wife about this and come back he went inside and he said prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is here he is asking for the hand of our daughter so the wife was very happy he said masha she said mashallah alham he said no it's not for him it's for julaibi so the wife started crying he said she said no no anyone but julaibi as soon as and the daughter was there in the house of course as soon as she heard this and this is a good example for our sisters as well i'm sure there are quite a, quite of many few sisters young from the young generation so the daughter was hearing all this uh, conversation and her mother started wailing and crying and you know uh, in rejection when the daughter heard this now let me tell you something about this daughter this this uh, sahabia she was known to be a pretty attractive girl 
but uh, you know uh, in in the ansars and it is said that you could hardly find anyone like her in in beauty but she was so shy that it is said that when she went out it is possible that even the sky had never seen her head or her hair uncovered the hair and she was humble and she was always uh taking care of her islamic duties and and you know her obligations so she, this uh, lady she this girl she said to her mother oh my oh my mother you should have the fear of allah ittaqullah what are you doing when the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has come to our doorstep asking for and made a decision when allah and his messenger has made a decision who are we to refuse him and he has come with a proposition how can we reject him and what are we going to tell him to go away think about it o oh mother and she said if that o oh my mother does not suit a believer to make their own decision when allah and his messenger has decided on a matter and do you think that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will come with something that will disgrace us because a lot of people they think whether if i give my daughter to this family will it, will she be honored will the society like it will this family keep my daughter happy many other things except for the deen the deen is normally kept on the last pedestal you know the last thing to consider the first thing is the degree where he is working what is his wealth and the family's status and so on this is the reality of life it's not like it is not important because prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said when a person he marries for four reasons right but in the end he said choose the deen and you will be successful may your hands be rubbed in in dirt or in in sand may, meaning you may you be successful wealth he mentioned beauty he mentioned and lineage he mentioned the three of the other things however people go the other way around yes we should look for these things as well so then this daughter she was imagining will prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when allah has said something in the quran and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam sunnah something is coming in the sunnah will it be disgraceful for us muslims prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said and this is an advice to the fathers and mothers if a young man of a good islamic status this is a translation i'm telling you which i don't remember the exact words but if a young man who is of a good islamic status he comes to you and asks for the hand of your daughter for marriage and if you refuse him if you refuse him whatever fitna occurs in earth you will be responsible for it this is an advice not to the youth but the caretakers and guardians of the youth if a young if a man of good islamic status he will come to you ask for the hand of your daughter and if you refuse him whatever fitna will take care obviously in consequence of that you will be responsible for it you know i had a very personal experience with regards to this which i would like to mention there was a family who had come for looking for marriage and we are we have i was uh, managing an islamic exhibition those days in dubai <clears throat> i'm sorry i i had a flu and my voice is cracking up now and uh, they had asked uh, they were looking for marriage and i had actually advised this this family who was looking for marriage for their daughter and directed them towards somebody who i knew of a good uh, family and good you know deen inshallah 
with good aqeedah but they refused him just based on the way he looked the father came and told me you know brother he looks uh, i look younger than him that's what his words were i look younger because he was mashallah aud billah clean shaven father and you know you didn't know where his forehead was and where his chin was so it, uh, he said i look and this brother had slight beard and stuff and he said i'm looking younger than him and it it wasn't the case actually it wasn't true but that was one of the things that they, they his phys- physical appearance was not very attractive eventually this uh, sister got married to someone and a very huge tragedy took place because what they were looking for was uh, some salman khan aud billah you know who also prayed five times a day you will not find salman khan praying five times a day by the way okay if you go out looking for hrithik roshan coming to the masjid in the morning fajar time you will not find it my brothers and sisters so you have to focus on certain realities of life when you get married it's a long term transaction you have to take into consideration some things four of the things prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned and the most important is the deen eventually they had a great tragedy where they found that the guy that she got married to was making zina and god knows what else drinking and all these kind of things a'ud billah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us so then the, the story goes on as we know of uh, the 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 time of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam of julaibi she said allah is not going to disgrace us so the mother said okay okay stop stop let me go and eventually you know then they agreed to this uh, marriage and julaibi got married to this uh, lady and eventually just after a short while <clears throat> during an expedition julaibi became shaheed he was martyred just a few days after his marriage and before the few days after his, uh, when he went to the uh, battlefield the father in law he advised him he told him ya julaibi it is not fard al ain on you to go there you are just newly married stay with your uh, wife imagine the most beautiful wife in your uh, girl in the community gets married to you who was nobody was even looking at you at that time and you are a young man and the call from allah and his messenger comes so julaibi he told his father in law what do you think that i should do when prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is out there facing the enemy who is atta- attacking us and he is probably going to be hurt or whatever and i will be sitting here at home with my wife and not go and defend the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is this what you're telling me to do of course the father had no answer to this today my brothers let me let us give uh, an analogy of this situation if the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes in danger or islam comes in danger or if our community comes in danger the muslims how many of us are ready to defend the youth especially the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we have a problem with the beard nowadays we have a problem with the niqab and the hijab we have a problem with implementing the sunnah on ourselves we are not able to you know because of the fashion it's not in fashion but when it is fashion people are wearing their uh jilbab and their their izars above their ankles but otherwise you cannot do it because people what what are people going to say because you are practicing whatever you are you are living for the people not for allah if you're going to wear your jilbab above your ankles 
what are people what is my friends in the school going to say or college if i'm going to don a beard you know nowadays beard has become a fashion by the way because bbc has posted researches uh, and independent in uk has posted research a scientific research that having a beard actually it uh, protects you from many diseases and bacteria and it's actually it actually acted acts like an antibiotic can you imagine that having a beard is like having a natural antibiotic everywhere you go and you before the germs are attacking you you are attacking the germs before the enemy is attacking you you are already attacking them with the beard <laughs> allahu akbar like once i was going in the airport one of the guys he just stood up when he saw me i said what happened to you because of this obviously very strange isn't it how allah azza wa jal puts the fear just by implementing the sunna and keeps even bacteria away from you all the jirasim from the small to the big shayateen they run away from you it's a protection automatic how many of us are ready he goes out jilaybib to the to the battlefield he becomes martyred and allah's uh, prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he orders his burial and he's given a burial of a shaheed how many of us are ready to sacrifice our newly wedded wife just a few days yeah and go out and sacrifice our wealth and our health and our life for islam nobody is asking us to do that today nobody but prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave us a few advices if which the youth they take care of insha allah uh they will be successful and some of the things points that i have uh, as prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said ightanim khamsa qabl al khams that take advantage of five before five and the first thing he mentioned was the youth before the youth before old age so take advantage of the youth before old age because when you are young you are able to do things that you are not able to do when you are older and this is the rule of life nobody can do anything about it and the most important thing especially for the for the youth today is to prioritize and focus did you know there was a time in the ottoman empire the time of ottoman empire majority of the uh, the, the history of the ottoman empire you will find that in the history of this khilafa you find that the muslims were the most successful empire ever to have existed in the history of all empires from around 700 to 1000 years they ruled not only from uh, the turkey and the uh, uh, you know uh, M- middle east and some of the northern african states but also a lot of europe all the way to spain portugal all the way to the west and many other countries in between and this was the time when sciences flourished the most sciences because not only that the youth and the the system was intertwined with islamic uh, education but their focus was only on ibadah on worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pleasing him when they invented a device it was not so that they can do well in business or they can make more money 
when they invented a device it was because so that they can calculate the time of the sunrise and sunset allahu akbar this was their thinking the astrolabe the distance between moon and earth all these things were actually created by muslims the camera you know where the word camera comes from it's an arabic word the word coffee is an arabic word it's shocking right the word camera comes from an arabic word because a muslim invented it astrolabe which uh, you know calculates distance of between stars and planets and it was a muslim who invented it why did they invent it so they can make business and sell it on ebay sell it online and make huge business no so they can calculate the times and worship allah azza wa jal the in the best way that they can as allah <coughs> had give them uh, given them resources with whatever resources allah had given them so the most important thing my brothers and sisters if the focus will be on islam and on pleasing allah this life is very short 100% you will get success in this life and in the akhirah but if this focus in this world you might get this world but you will lose the akhirah but there is a chance that you will lose this world as well you will khasar ad dunya wal akhirah but if the focus is to please allah as the hadith says when jibril alay salam was asked allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he got pleased with somebody he told jibril alay salam i am pleased with such and such person jibril alay salam goes and tells the uh, the angels of the of the earth allah is pleased with such and such person so you be pleased with them then the angels of the earth they come they come to the earth and the people of all the earth they get pleased and they start loving this person because allah was pleased with him automatically and it's the other way around if allah is displeased no matter how much you work for this dunya nobody will be pleased and we ask allah azza wa jal to guide us and our youth and those who are guardi guardians of our youth as well and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for whatever mistakes that i have made in this lecture it is from myself and whatever good is good that i have mentioned is from allah i ask allah azza wa jal to forgive us and guide our youth and we hope that the youth will be involved in such activities more and more and utilize their times aqul qawli hadha astaghfirullahi li wa lakum subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu